Hi, welcome to ECE 506 Parallel Computer Architectures. Now we are going to uh, discuss module one, uh, the third module in the first chapter, so module 1.3. This is perspective on parallel computers. In the previous module, I have uh, talked about the switch from single core design to multi core design, and I have also cover the power wall and uh, the power consumption as uh, one of the main drivers from switching to single core to multi-core. Uh, in this module I'm going to talk about parallel computers in general so it's not just including the uh, multi-core architecture but any systems that have uh, CPUs or processors interconnected tightly so that they can work together to solve a single problem. Okay. So, the, uh, the definition that I, that I like to use for parallel architecture is one by Almasy and Gottlieb. It says a parallel architecture is a collection of processing elements that can communicate and cooperate to solve a large problem fast. Now, if we look at this definition more carefully, there are several things that I want to highlight. The first is collection of processing elements. Right, so first, the definition. What is a processing element? Um, the the, the uh, Almasy and Gottlieb's definition is uh, not very clear about that. So, um, is it something that process instructions? Um, in that case, we can call a, a simple superscalar processor as parallel architecture because instructions are sent in parallel to different functional units. Um, however, most people will not consider a superscalar processor as a parallel computer. And thus, uh, it is helpful to kind of narrow down what's the meaning of processing elements. And in my case, my favorite definition would be um, Processing element is logic that fetches instruction from a single program counter and each instruction operates on a single set of data items. Um, so essentially this excludes superscalar processor as a parallel computer um, but it includes a thread context in a single core as uh, processing elements. So essentially if you have a single core that can execute multiple threads, they have, it has the ability to fetch instructions from different program counters. Um, then we will call that, we will categorize that as parallel computer. And the fact is that you can actually run parallel programs on that. Right? So, so the definition makes sense. Um, now, if we think about processing elements when we design parallel computers, we can. There are many choices, uh, such as how many processing elements do we want to have, how powerful each of them, and that will determine the scalability, right? How many, how many of them we we want, and so on. So, for example, there are some systems that choose to have few but very powerful cores or our processing elements and there are some systems with many small uh, processing elements such as the BlueGen uh, IBM BlueGen system. Another uh, word that I want to emphasize is the communicate. What does communicate means? means the processing elements need to communicate data with one another and the, the uh, the mechanism for communication depends on the programming model. So, for example, there is a system called shared memory in which uh, the memory is assumed to be visible to all the threads okay, or all, all the processing elements. Um, and there is another pro uh, programming model called the message passing in which it assumes that each processing element can only access its own memory. It cannot see or access or touch other processing elements' memories. 
Therefore, when one processing element wants to communicate with another, it has to send messages explicitly. So we are going to cover the shared memory versus message passing model more in uh, next slides. I mean, next next chapter actually. And uh, communication also involves interconnection network. So what is the interconnection network? Um, that is used to come uh, to to put the or to integrate all the processing elements so that they can communicate and the choices of interconnection network and uh, programming model actually determine the cost latency throughput scalability and even in some cases fault tolerance so uh, the communication is a very important and critical element of parallel computers now let's, like, let's look at the next phrase, which is cooperate. What does cooperate mean? Cooperate means that the processing elements, um, the, their computation is sequenced with uh, relative to, relatively to one another. Okay, so synchronization is the typical word for that. So in synchronization, uh, the primitives allow sequencing of some operations on some uh, processing elements relatively relative to the, the computation or of operations in uh, different processing elements. The reason for synchronization is for correct um, execution of the parallel program. However, again, synchronization actually has a wide range of choices. There are uh, important issues include granularity, how coarse grain or fine grain the synchronization primitives are, and the, the, the mechanisms behind that. So how are the synchronization primitives are implemented? Uh, the choice of synchronization primitive affect latency, load balance, scalability, and fairness. So again, this is a critical component in a parallel architecture. And finally, the phrase solve a large problem fast uh, indicates a choice of using the general purpose machine or a special purpose machine. Any machine can solve certain problems well. So now we have a choice of whether we uh, solve a, a small subset of problems really well, really fast, um, or we are able to solve all a, a wide range of problems relatively well but not very fast in any particular uh, problem all right so now uh, we know some of the choices in parallel computers let's look at the reason why people use parallel computers one of the uh, the first reason is absolute performance um, essentially uh, people are motivated by can we afford to wait for our computation to finish so for example um, the simulation of folding of a single protein uh, will take years to simulate on the most advanced microprocessor if we have just a single processor however it only takes days on a, a very powerful parallel computer okay Obviously, if we want to have a fast advance in science and discovery, then we really need to have that, that computation to be done as soon as possible, right? So it's critical in this case. There's no, uh, there's no way to replace uh, the latency in this case. A second example would be a weather forecast. Here, timeliness is crucial in the sense that we have to get the forecast before adverse weather hits right so if we can get extremely accurate weather forecast but it arrives late after the weather uh, after the adverse weather condition arrives then it's not very useful right so in there are some problems in which timeliness is crucial and hence we need uh, parallel computers now the second reason why people want to use parallel computers is is that they are just more um, cost effective 
cost performance effective or more power performance effective than uh, regular systems or non-parallel systems. Now typically this applies to a small systems with between two to eight chips. The smallest of this system will be a multi-core processor. Uh, in a multi-core processor because the cores are already integrated relatively tightly then it's relatively cheap to have a parallel computer. In fact, it does not cost much at all to have parallel computer. Okay. Now, so, so for, for small systems, uh, parallel computer is attractive, especially if you only have one operating system running. So essentially one, one software system, one software stack can manage all the hardware and you only have to have you know uh, uh, to, to buy one license uh, of the operating system as opposed to if you have multiple independent systems which will cost more money in, in terms of software and software in infrastructure now um, however for large systems uh, parallel computers are typically expensive and they are rarely cost performance effective uh, because essentially in, uh, in order to scale to a large number of uh, processors there needs to be like very uh, well designed hardware support that is not typically cheap and it grows super linearly uh, in, uh, com compared to the number of uh, processors or number of cores alright um, so in the past, right before, even before the switch to multi-core, parallel computers seem to be relegated only to the niche markets rather than to the mainstream computing market. And we'd like to see, or we'd like to understand why that was the case. So essentially, the reason why parallel architectures, parallel computers were not mainstream, were never mainstream until multi-core, was that the, that there, there was plenty of low-hanging ILP or instruction level parallelism fruits that people can pick easily. Okay? This made parallel computers unattractive in terms of course, cost performance. Um, well, there are several reasons for that. One is that it's expensive in terms of cost and design time to design scalable parallel systems. And the second reason is performance from parallelism was easily eclipsed by performance from instruction level parallelism in just a few years. Okay, so it was not economical to buy expensive parallel computers. And this went on until ILP fruits were higher hanging than the ones that come from thread level parallelism, which is when we transitioned to multi-core. And now pretty much um, most of the computer platforms we have are multi-core and therefore they can run parallel programs. Let me give you an illustration with regard to the uh, performance improvement from ILP versus from parallel computers. Alright, suppose we have a hundred processor system with perfect speedup. Uh, perfect speedup means uh, if I increase the number of uh, processors, I increase the performance uh, in, in proportion, per, in perfect proportion to the number of processors. Okay, so for example, okay, uh, let's say initially compared to single processor system, uh, in the first year when a parallel computer comes out, uh, our parallel computer is 100 times faster compared to the comparable uh, single processor system. However, if we just wait one more year, okay, that single processor system would have increased about 50% mm, in performance because of the improvement uh, in instruction level parallelism, right? Because essentially, uh, increased number of transistors 
is proportional to the increase in performance through instruction level parallelism when there were a lot of low hanging fruits. So in the second year, our parallel computer that we bought one year ago is only 62 times faster compared to the single processor system that we buy this year. And in the third year, it's only 39 times faster compared to the latest single processor system we can get. And in 10 years, essentially the parallel computer that we bought 10 years ago is actually slower than a single processor system that we can buy today. So essentially the speed improvement of instruction level parallelism makes parallel computers not uneconomical. Okay, so single processor performance catches up in just a few years. So we have to justify uh, the cost benefit uh, for investment in parallel computers. It has to break even or it has to give a positive return on investment in less than 10 years. So that's a very expensive proposition. Okay? Now uh, the case above that I mentioned is actually has not considered other factors that makes it makes the situation even worse. Okay? Um, for example, it actually takes longer to develop multiprocessor system. Right? So um, multiprocessor system cannot start from year one where it's hundred times faster than uh, the, the most recent single processor system it probably if, if the design time requires two years then um, when we have purchased the latest state-of-the-art parallel system is only 39 times faster than the state-of-the-art single processor system okay and then second is that big uh, low volume means prices must be very high uh, and therefore uh, it's common for hundred processor system to be much more than a hundred times more expensive compared to a single processor system. These high prices delay adoption for many people. And finally, the perfect speed up is typically unattainable. Right? So rather than you know having hundred processor system doesn't usually mean you have a hundred uh, times faster in performance because Perfect speed up requires extremely careful programming, a lot of optimizations, and so on. So, therefore, you know, this situation is actually is a lot worse than I illustrated earlier. Uh, thus, you know, it essentially they, they, there are not many people who uh, would buy a parallel uh, computers um, until you know until multi core essentially. All right, so now let's look at the taxonomy or category of uh, parallel computers. Uh, there's a Flynn, uh, Michael Flynn uh, proposed a, a very good taxonomy of parallel computers. Uh, it, it's more helpful than just defining processing elements because processing elements is quite ambiguous. So here he divided um, uh, parallel computers based on how many instruction streams it ha it can it can uh, fetch and how many data streams right so uh, there is a single instruction stream and multiple instruction streams single data stream and multiple data streams so that becomes SISD SIMD MISD and MIMD what's an instruction stream Essentially, instruction stream is a stream of instructions fetched from a single program counter. And the data stream is data items accessed by a single instruction. All right, let's, let's look at the uh, uh, category in, in more detail. The first one is SISD or single instruction stream, single data stream. Here, we can only fetch one program counter. Okay, suppose uh, we call the fetcher as a control unit or CU and each instruction accesses only one set of data for example it can maybe it fetches two operands and produce one result 
and the data is processed by some logic in which we will refer to as data processing unit or DPU. Okay, so here you can see from the figure instructions are fetched from the memory into the control unit. Control unit sends signal to the data processing unit to process data stream that is also fetched uh, from the memory. Okay, remember we have one program counter which means a sequence of instruction there is one sing single stream of instruction that is fetched by the control unit and data processing unit will execute instruction that will only fetch one set of data items from the memory All right so that's uh, SISD and SID, SISDX is actually not a parallel computer okay? but it, it completes the all the four categories the next one is SIMD SIMD is single instruction stream and multiple data streams. The examples include vector processors, multimedia extension instructions in regular processors, and nowadays will be the uh, graphics processing unit or GPU. In a SIMD, uh, essentially we still fetch a single instruction stream, so there's only one pro program counter However, that instruction is capable of uh, fetching and processing multiple sets of data items, which is essentially shown here, the data streams feed different data processing units. <coughs> um, the multimedia extension is interesting in that it achieves SIMD style execution without really going into SIMD. So essentially, rather than operating on many that many sets of data items, data items are packed into a single set of regular registers. Okay? So we will see some example uh, next. So here is an example of a, mm, multimedia instruction. Actually, here I am showing an addition uh, so let's say a 4 i equals to 0 to i less than 4 and here we are summing uh, two elements of matrix A matrix B and place that into matrix C now in the SISD machine here is how I'm going to do it so essentially I will loop I will create a loop I will have a loop index and I will add elements of uh, each uh, each pair of elements of A and B into C. In SIMD style, I'm going to do it differently because essentially I'm going to declare A and B as vectors and then rather than looping, a single vector instruction is capable of operating on uh, multiple elements of the uh, arrays. Hence, I only need to process C equals to a plus B. Now, in the Intel SSE um, multimedia instruction, uh, achieving SIMD style execution requires arranging data in such a way in, that they are stored in a pack uh, representation. Okay, so for example, um, the register width is 128 bits. And then in order to achieve SIMD execution, we pack uh, four quantities of 32-bit data. So here is an example. Here I have a vector 4. It shows like how many elements per register. And the operands will be A and B. And here we have assembly code. We first move the address of... Uh, or, or essentially move, move the pointer into register EAX and EBX. And then I will start execution, executing using uh, SSE instruction. So it essentially says move um, UPS, uh, move from address or from the pointer stored in EAX into SSE register 0. And then I also move uh, the, the uh, uh, data from 
pointer pointed by EBX into XMM1. All right, and then the next one will be the add vector instruction. So ADDPS, that's the one that add XMM0, XMM1, add them together and store the result in XMM0. Notice that the absence of a for loop here because one instruction adds a, a, a set of four data items. And finally, we save the uh, the return vector into sorry the the, the result in XMM zero into the address pointed by the return vector. Right, so that's uh, SIMD style execution. Next um, parallel uh, system is MISD. Here we have multiple instruction streams but only one single data stream. So an example of such systems is systolic array. Here we have uh, control units that fetch from different program counters. However, they process just the uh, data from just one data stream. And this uh, data is streaming from the memory into the, the first data processing unit in the next clock cycle it moves to the second data processing unit and moves to the third data processing unit and so on. So there's only one data stream. Okay. Now, uh, how is this used for computation? So we're going to look at uh, a, an example in matrix multiplication. So um, here we, we have a diagram of a systolic array to perform matrix multiplications. Uh, and then it's essentially here processors are arranged in two-dimensional grid and each processor is going to accumulate one element of the product okay, so at the end we will have a matrix of 3 by 3 um, so in order to uh, to multiply this essentially we will stream uh, matrix A from the left and essentially the elements will be arranged in the following way and they will be streamed in waves so the first cycle gonna stream in A00 the second cycles I'm gonna stream in A01 and A10 and so on and for the array B or sorry for matrix B it will be streamed from the top and again it will be streamed in a wave manner so you can see for example in the first cycle A00 and B00 is going to come in into this processing element uh, sorry into this uh, data processing unit and then they are going to be multiplied together okay and the result of the multiplication in the next clock cycle will be streamed into the next or the neighboring um, uh, DPU and so on right so you can see that for this type of problem uh, MISD is actually works quite well Intel actually manu manufacture iWarp using general processors rather than specific DPU we uh, the, the, the processors are connected with dedicated interconnect channels for register to register data transfer Right. However, the, the usefulness of MISD is relatively limited because uh, it, ha it works well for uh, certain kernels such as matrix multiplication but once we have a sparse matrix or irregular code and it, it becomes difficult to actually map computation to MISD. Now the uh, next parallel computer is MIMD. Now, by far, this is the most popular uh, parallel architecture. Uh, the variants of MIMD, there are actually a lot of variants of MIMD. They primarily differ in physical organization. Okay? So essentially, here we have uh, multiple uh, instruction streams coming in, and each of them operates on its own data items. So which memory at which memory hierarchy the uh, you know the, 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 they are connected together 
So I'm showing here there are four choices. The first one, figure A, show processors sharing the cache. Okay, so this is a shared cache architecture. Um, the second one, B, shows a, a shared memory architecture okay, in which uh, the caches are private to each core, but there is an interconnect in which they view the memory. Okay, let, let, let me go uh, backtrack a little bit. So uh, cases A and B, uh, the memory is shared by all the processors, so it's naturally um, it's natural to provide an abstraction of shared shared memory. And uh, B one uh, architecture in B, all the processors kind of have roughly equal access time to the memory, and therefore we can call that as uniform memory access architecture. Now in uh, case C each of the processor has its own cache and its own memory um, and there is an interconnection that connects the memories now this case is typically referred to as non-uniform memory architecture uh, or NUMA in NUMA essentially the processor's access time to the memory depends on which memory it will be faster when it accesses local memory it will be a lot slower when it accesses remote memory and the, uh, if the, the, the difference between local memory and remote memory access time is small then it's not a problem uh, we can just place computation anywhere um, however when the difference between local memory access and remote memory access is high then we have to be very careful where we place computation because it really affects performance and here is when NUMA uh, becomes very important trade placement and all these kind of things and the final one I have in D is distributed system in which the processors have their own cache, their own memory, their own I.O. and so on and the interconnection is provided at the I.O. level now because the system operating system has to manage the IO then typically this in this machine each of the slice here uh, is its own se separate system it has its own operating system and so on the thing that the machine provides is low latency message communication between different systems and because we have different systems running together then the last case is typically uh, referred to as the distributed system and so we have a wide range of machines here um, let's look at the what machine is actually used for a top 500 parallel computers okay, obviously you know there are many more smaller systems than large system that can uh, you know connect a large number of processors there's a lot more small systems however the it's interesting to see the top one the, the top end what what things people have integrated together and um, it's kind of like an engineering marvel so we'd like to to see what what they are so there is a website called top500.org that keeps track of the, the, the 500 fastest uh, parallel computers uh, you can see that and uh, you know several times a year the list gets updated uh, the interesting thing is that the ranking changes very fast okay? so for example the number one system in 2004 is the uh, NEC Earth simulator but in just two years it becomes number 10 right so in just two years uh, there are nine other uh, parallel computers that became that became um, online in production and faster than this one um, the 
Interestingly, also this uh, top parallel computers are so big, consume so much electricity, and cooling and heating and so on, that even the building, the plumbing and the cooling have to be co-designed with the computers. Here's the description of the Earth simulator, for example. The machine rooms sit at approximately fourth floor level. The third floor is taken by hundreds of kilometers of copper cabling, and lower floors house the air conditioning and electrical equipment. The structure is enclosed in a cooling shell, with the air pumped from underneath through the cabinets collected uh, to the two long sides of the building. The aero shell gives the building its pump up appearance. The machine rooms is electromagnetically shielded to prevent interference from a nearby expressway and rail. Even the halogen light sources are outside the shield, and the light is distributed by a grid of scattering pipes under the ceiling. The entire structure is mechanically isolated from the surroundings, suspended in order to make it less prone to earthquake damage. All attachments power, cooling, access walkways are flexible. So you can see from here that you know the, the machine, the architecture, and then the plumbing, cooling, and so on are actually co-designed um, with the machine. It, you know, this is just an engineering marvel. You can see here is the, uh, the way it looks. Um, you know, you can see uh, the first, I mean, the, the fourth floor here, this is where the servers are, right? The, the computers. And then the floor below that, this is just cabling. Uh, so cabling. And then the first two floors, these are combined together to, to house the power supply system and the air conditioning system. And then the air conditioning is blasted from the bottom. And then it goes to the top becomes uh, hot air and then it it travels through the air written duct and that's that's why the building looks like that is to provide the hot air a path to return to the first floor right and then the, if you can see a little bit the building is actually suspended uh, it has a seismic isolation system right so it, it says insulation by 11 layer rubbers right so it's very interesting um, the performance is 40 teraflops 80 percent of peak can be sustained um, real world performance is roughly 33 to 66 percent of the peak performance and the cost I, I would like you to guess it starts with a four um, it's more than four hundred dollars it's less than 400 million dollars so you can guess the maintenance cost 15 million dollars a year so that's a very uh, substantial and there is a failure of uh, one processor per week um, it's distributed memory parallel computing system with uh, 640 processor nodes interconnected by single stage crossbar networks okay so we will uh, look into all those terms later on now this is back in 2004 how about this year the top supercomputer this year is actually Tianhe 2 which is a computer that belongs to National University of Defense Technology of China it mm, reaches 33 tera floating point operations per second with lean pack this machine has 3 million cores Right, so it's, it's, it's just mind-boggling numbers. It has 3 million cores organized into 16,000 nodes. Each node has 195 cores consisting of essentially two Intel Xeon IP bridge processors and three in Intel Xeon Phi processors. And it consumes huge amount of electricity, so 18 megawatts. All right, so that concludes our discussion on parallel uh, systems. Now the rest of the uh, course, we are going to look at uh, smaller parallel 
architectures uh, rather than these humongous systems uh, because when we want to build a humongous systems we have to start from small and we have to know how they work and what are the challenges to scalability and so on all right until next time